Hey all, it's Professor Tracy back with another Negotiable Instruments lecture. Now this one's focusing on something that may seem very small and not really uh, necessary to have a separate lecture on, but I think there's some nuance there that needs to be considered. And so our focus here is on the underlying transaction. And this is one piece of a broader topic about liability on the negotiable instrument. Uh, because we've considered things like who are the, the various parties to a negotiable instrument, what makes it transferable, uh, when, and we now are looking at, well, who exactly is it that's liable on that instrument? And to understand that, we've got to be able to understand the relationship between the negotiable instrument, so either the note or the draft, and the underlying contract, the underlying transaction. And so that's what the focus of this lesson is on. So let's hop to it. So the first thing is exactly that, looking at what is the relationship between these two things. And then we'll talk about some about the liability and of the, the parties to the underlying obligation and how that relates to the instrument itself. But first we'll look at the instrument and the underlying obligation. So we're gonna go through a series of examples here that will help us understand how those things interact together. And the first example here deals with an ordinary check. And what, what I mean by ordinary is as compared to something like a teller's check or a cashier's check or a certified check, this is just an ordinary check that has the three parties we've been discussing. And remember, in order for something to be a check, it, it, to be a draft that qualifies as a check, it's the drawee must be a bank. And so when we talk about the check here and just an ordinary check, we've got a underlying transaction between Bob and Barb. And Bob has promised to pay Barb a $10,000 and in exchange, she has promised to deliver to him a Honda Fit. And so we have a basic contract, right? The purchase and sale of a good, in this case, a car. And there is a promise of, of payment from Bob of $10,000. Now, if he gets a check and writes out a check to Barb, remember what that would mean practically is he's got a check. He is the drawler of that check. He would be ordering his bank, the draw E, to pay the payee, Barb. So he's, it's going to say, please pay to the order of Barb $10,000. And so that's an ordinary check. It's drawn on his own funds from his own account, ordering his own bank to pay the payee. And so here, as the check is telling us, it's just an ordinary check drawn on Bob's own funds from his account. And he gives this check to Barb. And the question we have to ask is when he writes out the check and he issues it, right? That's that first part of the life of a negotiable instrument is the issuance of it. When he issues that check to Barb, then we've got to say, well, what is the effect on his obligation and the contract to pay Barb $10,000? And then the answer is when he gives the check to Barb it, and she takes the check, which is what when we say she, uh, when it comes over here, we're saying not only does Bob proffer the check, offer it to Barb, but she takes that check. And at that point, it doesn't discharge this, meaning he hasn't fulfilled his obligation in the underlying contract to pay her $10,000, but it suspends that obligation. And it makes sense that it wouldn't yet discharge it if we pause everything right at this moment, because Barb still doesn't have the $10,000 in funds. She has a check, which hypothetically will be paid out by Bob's bank in the amount of $10,000. But until that occurs, that that obligation there of Bob's to pay 
$10,000. And if we're just focused in on this obligation, then we would say that Bob is the obligor of this obligation and Barb is the obligee. And this obligation is suspended at that point. It's frozen. That's a snowflake, even if it doesn't look like one. So that's a snowflake. And if we're thinking, okay, it suspends things, and then there are two possible paths, right? His obligation suspended, and then the check can take two, one of two possible paths here. One is it could be paid out by the bank, right? It could be paid. The other is the bank could dishonor that check. The, the most likely reason for that is you have insufficient funds in your account. But the one of two things is going to happen. It's going to be paid out or at least ultimately one or two things is going to happen. It's going to be paid out by the bank or it's going to be dishonored by the bank. If it's paid out, then what happens is Bob's obligation is discharged, right? It was suspended and once it's paid out, it would be discharged. If, however, the bank dishonors that check, then his obligation is no longer suspended, right? It's revived, it's unfrozen, whatever you want to say, unsuspended. It's no longer suspended, it's alive again, and it can be sued on at that point again because he hasn't fulfilled it, it's no longer suspended, it's live, it can be sued on, he has to follow through. If the check has been dishonored, no longer is it suspended, at that point, Barb could sue if Bob is not going to follow through. So if we follow our narrative here, we said that Bob gave the check to Barb that suspended his obligation to pay her $10,000. And now if the check is dishonored, meaning it's not paid by the draw e bank, we assume that, right? And the check is very sad about it. Then you saw that it's no longer suspended. Green snowflake goes away. And that obligation is live and Barb could sue if Bob doesn't follow through, right? So Barb would have two options here. She could sue and, and realize in this case where this is all that happens, the check's been dishonored. Well, Barb has two possible avenues of, of redress here. She could sue to enforce the check. So she could sue on the negotiable instrument as the payee of that negotiable instrument, she, she is able to sue the drawler of that, of, the, of that check, which would be Bob. So she could sue on the negotiable instrument and enforce the check against Bob now that it's been dishonored and it's sad, but, or she could sue for breach of contract on the underlying transaction. Since it's no longer suspended, she could sue for that, but it's an or. She can't get a double recovery. She can pursue one or the other to, as an avenue of recovery, but she will not be able to get a double recovery. But either one is an avenue of redress for the injury that she has suffered here, which is Bob saying, oh, I'm paying with a check, and then the check being dishonored. And so him not, in fact, paying the $10,000 that he owes Barb. So let's look at another example here with, with a little more complexity to it, but still with an ordinary check. And so we've got the check again saying, hey there, still just an ordinary check. So the check is saying, and we're picking this one up with Bob's already given the check to Barb for the $10,000, and that has suspended his obligation to pay the $10,000. Okay, now we're adding some complexity, which is instead of the check being dishonored in the hands of Barb, we're going to assume that she transfers that check to this entity I'm going to call uh, check casher, check casher. We'll call this check casher and she transfers it to check casher and then it's dishonored, right? Sad check again. So when it's dishonored, whether it's in the hands of Barb the payee or whether it's been negotiated to check casher, when it is dishonored, that unsuspends this, right? It revives it. We, we said there are two paths for that check. It will either be paid out by the bank or it'll be dishonored. It was dishonored again and it's in the hands of check casher. So the question we have to ask here is, 
what are Barb's remedies, right? What, what is this? Because there's a risk, just like in the previous example, we said Barb can't sue both on the negotiable instrument and on the underlying contract. It's one or the other because there's a risk of double paying. There is here too. If we assume that this person, this check casher, is able to enforce this instrument as, say, a holder in due course, then they could go after Bob and saying, hey, the check wasn't paid out. They could go after him. And Barb could go after Bob for breach of contract, right? So check casher can say, I'm suing on the negotiable instrument. You're liable as the drawler of a check that was dishonored that I'm going after you. But then Barb can go after and collect on the sales contract here, the sale of goods. So that could be, that's a writ. If we allowed both of those, Bob would end up paying twice. So how do we deal with that? How does the law make sure Bob is not subject to liability twice? Well, we, we do this. We say that when she sent this check to check casher, when she transferred it or negotiated it, uh, then we would say, well, ordinarily, when that happens, when she gave up the check, when she negotiated it to check casher, she gave up her rights to the check, which is obvious, right? That's like, oh, okay, right? She obviously gave it away. She negotiated it to check casher, but the law says that she also gave up her rights on the underlying obligation, which sounds crazy, but that's the way to prevent Bob from being liable twice, is to say, and to maintain that this check is still negotiable, right? For the check casher to know, yes, I can sue. When I get this, if it's not honored, I can sue the, someone who signed that check, drawer in our example. And that would be, that is one way to maintain negotiability. The so we would say, okay, that's why Barb gave up not only her right to sue on the check, but her right to sue in the underlying transaction. But the question is, so is, is Barb just out of luck? Because it's like, well, then what does she do? She hasn't been paid. She negotiated this check. And the key thing to understand is ordinarily, if this transaction occurred, right? If this transaction occurred where she got the check, remember it suspended Bob's obligation, and she's gonna negotiate that check to check casher, ordinarily, she's entering into a contract with check casher saying, you pay me some amount of money. It may be a promise of $8,000, although remember, in order for that to be value, for purposes of Article Three at least, for purposes of making um, check casher a holder in due course, that would have to be not just a promise, but an executed promise, them actually paying money. But in terms of straight contract law between Barb and check casher, it wouldn't matter. The promise would be consideration. And so when she transferred it, then she would have gotten a promise at the very least of something for it. She's not just giving check casher that check for free, right? So her avenue of recovery then would be to go after check casher if she hasn't gotten anything, any money from them already. If she already has, then she's not out anything, right? She doesn't need to be able to sue on it. My point in going to this, remember, is to say, we said that when she gave up the check, she gave up not only her right to sue in the check, but her right to sue in the underlying transaction. And we said, well, does that mean she's got zero chance of holding anybody liable? And the answer is no, because ordinarily she would be able to get something from the party that she had negotiated the check for because she's not giving them the check for free ordinarily, right? That this would be some sort of transaction like the one identified here where she's getting something for it. And that would mean either she got the money already or if they haven't paid or are refusing to pay, she can go after them. So she does have an avenue of getting money, right? So let's look at yet still another example, just an ordinary check, right? Mr. Check there going, yep, still just an ordinary check. 
So here, we're going to look at what if the check is stolen or what if it's lost? And Bo shows up here to steal the check, right? He steals the check, dashes off, stole it right from Barb. Well, what if it's lost? It just disappears, right? Then, so if it's lost or if it's stolen, there is, again, this question of double paying, right? This risk, because what we're looking at is how do things work? with the relationship between a negotiable instrument and the underlying transaction. And here, Barb received the check, and that's why this obligation is suspended, right? Because Bob gave the check, it suspended his obligation until either it's paid off, and that means his obligation would be discharged if the check were paid, or if it's dishonored at that point, his obligation would no longer be suspended. It would be revived. But here, just like in the previous example with check casher and the, the voluntary transfer from Barb to check casher, here we have Bo stealing it or we have Barb just losing it. And there's still this risk of Bob being exposed to double liability or double payment of the, of, of the amount here because this, this check... Um, it, it, what do we have? If that lost check or stolen check ends up in the hands of a holder in due course, right? Someone who didn't know the history of the check, that it was lost or that it was stolen, it doesn't know anything about that. They, it's in their hands. Well, then if the check is dishonored, they could then sue Bob on that check, right? If it were dishonored. And again, Barb, if that if she never received anything, which presumably she didn't, right? Because it, well, she did, and then the check was stolen. But if the check is dishonored, it would have been dishonored in her hands as well. So here, though, if you say, okay, it's dishonored, then what does that mean? Well, she could sue for breach. There's double liability on Bob again, and we don't allow that. We said, well, what does that mean? If the check is lost or stolen, then Barb can still enforce, and this again, counterintuitive, we, we treat her as still having rights on the check because the, if it's lost or if it's stolen, she is still a person entitled to enforce her rights on the check. She didn't voluntarily give up the check. She didn't transfer it or negotiate it. It's been transferred. I shouldn't say she didn't transfer it, but it certainly was not negotiated. Um, and in this case, we would say, what does that mean? Well, that means even if she is not holding the check anymore, she can still has rights she can enforce but she can't sue on the underlying obligation because there would be a risk of double liability because that would mean the right, the, the independent right, like a holder in due course with the check could sue and the she could sue independently of the check on the underlying transaction. We're not going to allow that if the check was lost or stolen. Her ability is to sue on the check as it as a um, as a negotiable instrument, and we'll talk more in the next lesson about well, how does all this work then? With if somebody else has the check and she still has the rights to the check, we're going to unpack that more moving forward. So, with example four, we're now not looking at an ordinary check, but a cashier's check. A cashier's check. So we've got same basic setup with Barb and Bob. Instead of him getting an ordinary check, he has a fancy dancy cashier's check, right? Going, I'm a mighty cashier's check. And there they got this check where, and we've got to say, what is it? What is a cashier's check? What makes it so different than an ordinary check? And here's the things to understand about a cashier's check is one, it is, you need to understand that somebody, if Bob's going to use a cashier's check, he goes to the bank and buys the cashier's check. And the check is drawn on the bank's own funds, not on the purchaser's funds. Meaning it wouldn't be on Bob's funds in his account. 
It's on the bank's funds, their, the, the money they have, which is considered to be guaranteed funds, money that's definitely there. And the bank is writing the check on itself, its own funds. So it is ordering itself to pay the money to the payee, in this case, Barb. So, and Bob is just buying that check. And so that here, you would say the drawler is the bank and they're saying, we're ordering ourselves to pay you this money to Barb, the payee. And the value here is, why is it called a, a cashier's check or a teller check? Because, or a certified check, is that it's the bank, it's the teller or the cashier at the bank who signs it, right? In, in, in the, the name of the bank. So it's considered guaranteed funds, guaranteed funds, meaning it's like cash, right? It's like cash. This is why it's very common at, at a closing on a house or something to require a cashier's check because it's guaranteed to be there. It is the, the equivalent of the person paying cash, but instead of having this wad of cash they're bringing around, they've got this cashier's check or teller's check. So there, when the cashier's check is given because it's like cash, this obligation here is not just suspended. If Barb takes it, meaning she agrees to take the cashier's check, then it doesn't suspend it. It's discharged. It's done. He satisfied that obligation because it's like cash. It's as good as cash. And so that means it immediately satisfies or discharges that obligation. So let's look at a variation of that with the cashier's check. We're going to take it here where the cashier's check picking up with Bob's given the cashier's check to Barb. It's in her hands. We said that discharges his obligation. But what if she loses the cashier's check? What if she loses it? Well, if, and you could say, well, she lost it. She never received any actual funds because she never went and deposited it and had the funds put into her account. Then the answer is it doesn't matter. The rule under Article 3 is the same. This obligation is discharged. It's on Barb. If she lost it, didn't wasn't careful with the with the with the check, as soon as she took the check. It discharged Bob's obligation. It's the same result. If, Bar if Bob proffered it and Barb took it, then that discharged that obligation he had to pay $10,000. And if she subsequently loses it, it's on her. So example five here, back to looking at an ordinary check. Same setup. Bob has an ordinary check. So in other words, he's the drawler and the drawee is in the, he's ordering his own bank to pay money out of his own funds uh, to, Bar to Barb. And so Mr. Checks here again, Mr. Ordinary Check is back, gives the check. We said that suspends that, right? When takes that, it doesn't discharge, right? So if we, we rewind this and say, well, what happens if they're operating at a distance and Bob is sending that check by mail, sending it by mail, and it gets lost along the way, meaning it never arrives in Barb's hand? Does that suspend this obligation? Can it possibly discharge that obligation if it gets lost? And the answer here is no. It's not. It's only if Barb takes the check for the obligation, right? He may have mailed it and proffered it, but if she never received it, she can't take it. She never had the opportunity to take the check, so it doesn't suspend her, Bob's obligation. And here, she also, let it be said, if she never possessed the check, she's never a holder of the check, she wouldn't have any right to enforce it. So this obligation would be never suspended and Barb, the obligee of that obligation, would be able to sue on that obligation because 
it, she never got it, right? It's on Bob if the check doesn't get there. There's nothing, that's not, Barb doesn't have to be stressed out about it. She never had the check, so she can't sue on it. It's not like our example where she had it and then it was stolen or had it and it was lost. So here, that's what we said, right? As we just mentioned, where she, what she can do is if Bob's thinking, well, I sent it, it, it got lost, that's on you, I'm done. The answer is no, she hasn't been paid. He, this was never suspended, she can sue Bob on the underlying obligation, the underlying contract. Another example with an ordinary check, the same exam, same basic contract, check sent to Barb. So in this case, remember, she takes the check, it suspends his obligation. And then if that check is then she negotiates it to check casher here, right? They have their own little contract. They're going to give that she gives the check over and they have yet to do it. Now here, remember, this is Bob's bank. This is the draw E of that check. And when check casher demands payment from Bob's, the draw E bank of the check that they're holding, that's called presentment, right? That's the presentment of the check here. So it's presented to the draw E bank and if they pay it in full, what happens? Well, remember we said, if the check is paid in full, it discharges this obligation. It discharges it, right? So that was, so there we go. They gave the money to check casher. Check goes to Bob's bank, who's the draw E bank of the check that originated with Bob, the drawer. And we said at that point, right, they paid. So keep in mind here, we're assuming that all they did was promise to pay money to Barb, but never delivered it. If that's the case, then this is exactly like the previous example we're looking at, where we wouldn't allow, when Barb got rid of the check, we said she lost any, she gave up her rights to the check and her rights to the underlying obligation. One way you see that play out here, where I think it's clearer than the previous example is, if, if we're talking about the check being paid out, then the underlying contract, remember that when she took the check, the first thing we can say, right? So let me, instead of me uh, getting out in front of my uh, the slides here, let's say that one, what can we say about where Barb stands here? When, if, if this is where things are at, they the his bank has paid the check out, but they've yet, check casher has not yet paid Barb. Well, the first thing we can do is go back and say, when she agreed and took the Bob's check, Bob's obligation was suspended, right? And we noted that with our snowflake here, that it's frozen. Then the second thing we can say is when this bank, the draw E bank, Bob's bank, the draw E bank paid out the check for this amount for a two check casher, that discharged that obligation, which that's what we've been saying all along, that when that instrument is paid out, it because either it's going to be dishonored or it's going to be paid out and discharged. Here, it would be paid out and discharged, which means Barb could not sue Bob because that obligation was discharged when the check was paid out. And we know, right, that she gave up her rights on the check in exchange for the promise of money from check casher, right? And we can say two things here, right? Not only what we said previously, when she gave up the rights to the check, she was giving up her rights in the underlying agreement. Here, that's driven home by the fact that this was paid out and therefore this would be discharged anyhow. Keep in mind that even if it were dishonored by the bank, that she still would not be able to sue Bob there, right? Because we said when she gave up the check, she gave up her rights to that check and to the underlying obligation. She gave up those rights in exchange for a promise from check casher for $8,000, okay? And so when we look at this, the third thing we can say about Barb's status here is she gave up her rights in the check, she did so because she, from, 
in exchange for a promise of money from check casher. And then, well, what's her remedy here? Just like we talked previously, her remedy would be able to go, when looking at this, right? This is what we said is true. This was suspended. They pay out the check. That, that means that was discharged. That's why it's gone. It's that, that obligation is discharged and satisfied. So that's done. And Barb's remedy then is to go after check casher to enforce its promise to pay it $8,000, right? So that's how that would work. What about a promissory note? Our focus has been on checks, whether they're ordinary checks or cashier's checks. And here, if we go with Bo and Bob entering into a loan, right? A loan, which remember, a loan is still a contract. The underlying transaction is still a contract. There's a promise here from Bob to lend Bo $25,000. So I'm gonna, he's going to give $25,000 in exchange for a commitment from Bo to pay back over a period of time $25,000 at an, at an interest rate of 5%. So that would be the underlying transaction. Then here is where the negotiable instrument comes in. So again, separate these out, even though it may be like, well, isn't this the, what, it, what is manifested here? Yes, but there's still an underlying contract and a separate negotiable instrument, which is the note here, the promissory note. So when, it's, when he's saying, writing this out, I hereby promise to pay $25,000 plus interest calculated 5% to the order of Bob, full payment due in five years, that is, that's the note. And that is a separate thing from the underlying transaction. But the, so uh, just like with the check, Bo makes out this, he, the negotiable instrument issues that note, the negotiable instrument to Bob, that is we need to keep in mind what's going on. But here, let's follow the hypothetical and we'll talk again about, well, what, what's, what's going on? Here, one year later, Bo's going, I'm in dire financial straits. And Bob's thinking, maybe I should sue Bo to collect on that note he gave me before he goes into bankruptcy. But keep in mind, it's only been a year and it doesn't come due for five years right? For five years. So he's wanting to sue. And the question is, can he do that? Be, uh, and when he's concerned that Bo's going to go into bankruptcy and he won't be able to collect on it. And, you know, does he just have to sit by because it hasn't come due yet? And the answer is he cannot sue right now because it has not come due. Keep in mind why. Why? So keep in mind, just like with the check, when Bo issues this, issues the note, it's him issuing a negotiable instrument to Bob. And when Bob takes that negotiable instrument, it suspends this part of the underlying contract. It's suspended for how long? Until either that note is paid or it is dishonored. If it's not due for five years, it hasn't been dishonored yet, and it hasn't certainly hasn't been paid off yet. So here we'd say Bo's debt remains suspended until the note is paid or dishonored, even though, and, and the fact that he's making noises of, I'm having, you know, I don't know if I'm going to have money, I'm in a difficult spot, that doesn't allow Bob here to do anything at least if this is just a simple note and lending agreement. And we'll talk in just a second about, well, what are some possibilities here for Bob? So the other thing to keep in mind is if it, again, if it hasn't been dishonored and it hasn't been paid, then it, it, it doesn't come due for another four years. It's only been one year out of the five years on which that, of, the, uh, of when the instrument will come due. And so in that case, this is the kind of situation where there's nothing in this basic setup that we've given that, that Bob can do. He, he really does just have to wait and see what happens. So how would you get around that? The way you would get around it 
is ordinarily you might put a provision in there that allows you as the creditor, the lender, to be able to accelerate what what is due for any number of potential reasons in order to avoid this kind of problem. And uh, so we will look in more detail at some of those uh, types of provisions you might put in uh, down the road. But that those are the kinds of things you'd want to put to maybe save yourself or help yourself in a situation like this. So I want to talk briefly too about this other topic about payment in full, payment in full checks, payment in full checks. What do we mean by that? Well, the setup is this. Let's assume we've got Bob and uh, Barb again and the Honda Fit transaction. Same thing we've been looking at. She has the car here, delivers the car to Bob and Bob looks at the car and he goes, this car is not in the condition Barb promised it would be. It's worth $5,000 at most. I'm certainly not going to pay $10,000 for it. And then Barb is saying, you wanted a Honda Fit. I gave you a Honda Fit. It may not be in excellent condition, but it's in good to fair condition. $10,000 is a bargain for what you got to pay up. So here we have a disagreement about the, between the parties, right? She's saying, I'm entitled to the full amount of money. And Bob's saying, I have a good faith dispute about whether or not this vehicle satisfies what you and I agreed to, that you are supplying me a Honda Fit worth $10,000. And he's saying, I don't think you did. I think it's worth about 50% of that amount of money. And so they have a dispute. And then what happens, remember that Bob is supposed to pay $10,000. Well, here's what you we're, we're looking at with this payment in full check. And it is an example of what was referred at common law to a court in satisfaction. That you have a check. Bob writes out a check here, but it's for less than the $10,000. But he marks it, he notes on it, in you know big bold letters payment in full right it, so it's a check made out to barb he is signing it as the drawee and he's saying payment in full meaning you and i have a dispute about this i think it's only worth about five you think it's worth ten i'm saying here i am offering you this we can settle our dispute with this check here it is. It's conspicuously marked payment in full, and I will pay you $7,500. So he transfers that $7,500 check to Barb, and then we have the satisfaction part of accord and satisfaction, which is what? Now, if we got Barb has the check, she takes the check, right? She, she received the check. If she then takes the check, and deposits the check at the bank and they pay out and she takes the money that is paid out knowing that Bob marked it paid in full. If she's fully aware that that's what it says, it's marked in that way and she gets the check, then that is the satisfaction. If she knows that he intended it as full payment, of for the, or the amounts due under the contract and she goes, takes the check, knowing what it was intended for, understanding it's in full payment of her outstanding claim against him for the $10,000 and she accepts payment from the bank on that check, then at that point, that's the satisfaction of the accord. That extinguishes not only any obligation under the you know the the quote unquote the accord, but also on the underlying agreement for the ten thousand dollars for the car, that obligation is now extinguished. So the result is what is this right? When Barb obtained payment of the check, Bob's obligation was discharged in its entirety, and any claim that Barb had to more money is out the window. Right? It too is discharged or extinguished. So 
there's some things to know about the rule, right? We're going to look at first just the three basic requirements of this rule about payment in full checks, and then we'll look at some nuances. So the three basic requirements are the check has to be tendered in full payment of the claim, just like it was here, and we'll run through how it applied here, but there's also got to be the amount of the claim is subject to bona fide dispute. So that the claim here, the claim in our example was for the $10,000. There's got to be an actual good faith bona fide dispute. Not just that one party's being a jerk or trying to sneak payment to, you know, sneak uh, past a, a check past the other party to, to pay less, but that they have a dispute and that the, pay, the check is being given in full payment of settlement of that claim between them. And that then the claimant obtained payment of the instrument, right? That's when we have the satisfaction, is when the payment is made on that instrument. That's when the satisfaction occurs and the full effect of the payment in full check occurs. So here, if we apply it to Barb and Bob's dispute about the car, we can say, well, what about this first one? A check tendered in full payment of the claim. We know that it was, right? He, they had a dispute about what the car was worth. And he says, this is payment in full. He intended it that way. It was marked that way. So we can say, yes, that's what occurred. What about the second one here? That the amount of the claim was subject to a bona fide dispute. We saw that, right? Where Bob's going, this car's in the con not in the condition Barb promised would be. It's worth $5,000 at most. I'm certainly not going to pay $10,000 for it. And Barb going, you wanted a Honda Fit, and I gave you a Honda Fit. It may not be in excellent condition, but it's in good to fair condition. $10,000 a bargain for what you got. Pay up. So they had a dispute, and we can say it is a bona fide dispute about whether the car is worth ten grand or not, the promised amount or not. And then did the claimant here, Barb, did she obtain payment of the instrument? We saw that, right? That we saw that the check was paid out by the bank and she received the money. So we can say yes. They, so those three basic requirements were met. Those three basic requirements of when we're talking about payment in full, uh, a payment in full check and how it operates. But there are some really important nuances of the rule, which if you're going to think about, well, what are the things that are typically tested or picked up on in an exam or bar exam? These are often some of them in these kinds of situations, which is one, keep in mind that the notation must be conspicuous, that meaning the, the payment in full on the check has to be something that is visible to a reasonable person, a person of ordinary uh, intelligence and uh, ability. They would notice it. It's not something hidden away or trying to be snuck by the other party, by the payee. Um, and here, the other thing is the notation does not need to be on the instrument itself. It could be on an accompanying sheet of paper, uh, some separate piece of paper that's attached in order to communicate that is fine. It need not be on the instrument itself that it's marked payment in full. Either way, it has to be conspicuous, right? It can't be some little tiny uh, words buried in some big agreement you've attached, but it's got to be something or long letter or whatever. It's got to be conspicuous, but it can be on something other than the instrument. It has to be done in good faith. And by that, A, that means something we said already, that they genuinely have a dispute. It's not just the drawler, right? The person uh, like in Bob's shoes going, well, I don't want to pay 10 grand. So I'm going to try to get the person to accept this check so that it's something less, right? That they take it and uh, I can pay less and whatever. I, I just hope to, to pull one over them. The other thing about that then is they have a bona fide dispute and they're doing it in good faith. And, and that's related to this idea of I'm not trying to take advantage of you. I'm not I, I'm doing this in honesty and in good, you know, that it is honesty in fact, that it is good faith, meaning that it's 
and in compliance with commercially reasonable standards and not anything less than that. I'm trying to settle an honest dispute. And then the here, this is an important thing to understand is that the refund, right? You may seek a refund. So Barb, for instance, Barb, for instance, let, let's say she takes the money. She gets all the way down the road where we said when we looked at the rule requirements that she gets paid out on this. If it were not clear, if she was unaware that it was intended as payment in full, then Article 3 says she can get a refund of that money, return it, to Bob and Sue for the uh, full amount she's due. But if she was aware, right, it's the awareness that matters here. If she knew it, why? Because it was conspicuous and she saw it. If she knew or should have known that it was on it, then she cannot get a refund. She can't say, oh, I've changed my mind. Here, I'm going to refund the money and then sue you for the amount, the full amount that's due. If she, if it was there and it was conspicuous and she either knew it or she should have known, then she's out of luck. This last thing is not available to her. But if she was genuinely unaware and did not have knowledge of it and she, and uh, shouldn't have had knowledge of it because of the way things were done, then she can get a refund. So that is uh, how that works. So those are the nuances. That there, there's lots more to come on the issue of liability on the instrument. So there will be more to come. I hope that that's helpful. I'll be in touch shortly. If it was, please do like and subscribe as always. And uh, I appreciate your support. I'll be back with more. Thanks a lot.